what the polls say matters no longer. What is being counted now are your and my votes. And this is Guildford where one of the ballot boxes is being opened and they've got there, you can see the grey and the white ballot slips that have got to be separated out before the count can begin and this is happening all over Britain in counting stations at the moment. The polls closed at 10 o'clock and it's now just before 11 o'clock and they've only reached that stage so it'll obviously be some time before we get the first result which we think may be from Glasgow. We'll perhaps go up there in a moment and uh, see how things are going there. A high poll we're told despite bad weather and welcome back to all of you who were with us a moment ago. Welcome to those of you who've just joined us. Good evening, we'll be on the air here with Decision 79 until 4 o'clock in the morning, by which time we should have a very good indication and that scoreboard behind me, which at the moment shows nothing, will be giving us some clue as to who is to form the next government of Britain. Well, we've had a lot of talk about polls over the last few weeks, four weeks or so, and David, I just wonder whether you think that tonight we're going to see anything like an even swing as a result of the things those polls have been showing over the United Kingdom. I think we shall see a reasonably even swing, a more even swing than most people have been saying across the country as a whole, except in Scotland. And Scotland is the trouble because our first result comes from Glasgow, and it may not tell us much about what's happening in the rest of the country where the election is really decided. Well, Glasgow Central, which has the smallest constituency in the United Kingdom, is the first count that's being done at Glasgow. They're, they're doing something like a dozen counts there tonight, but Glasgow Central, which is a safe Labour seat and won't give us all that much clue of what's happening, and Scotland, as we'll be hearing in a moment, is anyway different from the rest of the country, nevertheless may well be the first vote, the first vote to be announced. Well, with me here tonight in the election studio, there are a number of other guests, most of whom you have seen in these programs before, some of whom if you haven't seen in these programs, you've seen in other programs. Among them, Angela Rippon, who is going to be giving us results as the evening goes along, and then who's going to be summing up regularly the state of the story, so that if you've missed something or missed an important result or whatever it is, she'll be able to fill you in on that. And next to her, Robert McKenzie, who's got his swingometer, who's got a battleground without which she doesn't feel at home and all the seats that are at risk and the state of the liberals and heaven knows what else and in a moment we'll go to Bob and just hear from him how he sees things tonight at this stage when the polls have closed and before we've had any proper results in and then on the other side of the studio he doesn't have anybody with him at the moment but he may have a word for us is Robin Day yes I shall be performing my usual humble function and I shall be talking to victors and vanquished and veterans like Lord Hailsham and some of Fleet Street's leading thinkers, such as Peregrine Worthstorm and Peter Jenkins. Well, that will all be in a moment. Let's just have a look at the prediction in a second that we made here. Now, there's a great gap, obviously, between what the polls say and what the computer, with the help of all the experts, the sophologists, the statisticians, the answer that that gives and the answer that we as a country give. But let's just have a look at the prediction that we're showing at the moment. It's going to vary, and it's kept very wide open now. This is roughly what we think, as a result of all that information, is likely to be the outcome. You can see that there's a broad, a broad difference between Labour Conservatives. It looks very much as though the Conservatives on this basis will get the 318 they need, because the low level is 311, the high 335. Labour, on the other hand, 273 to 297, not enough on their own to form a government. The Liberals, rather wide variation between 5 and 13, SNP 1 to 5, that's obvious. One thing I should say about that, Big Ben, when you see it, if you want a time check, does actually tell the right time, and it'll be um, telling the right time whenever it appears by some kind of computerized magic. Now, the party leaders in this election have played a, an important role. Mrs. Thatcher, you remember, said, I'll only be given one chance to win or lose. And Mr. Callaghan has said that he'll go on happily for another five years, though some people say that he may feel happier to retire to his Sussex farm. But uh, down at Flood Street, where Mrs. Thatcher is this evening at the moment, is Michael Charlton. Michael, do you have any idea what Mrs. Thatcher's plan is tonight, or, or indeed any feeling about how the election's gone from Flood Street? No, I don't know, David. I think uh, everybody is listening uh, to you at the moment. Uh, we know that she's in here, as we told you earlier, in, in the house... Uh, behind me and we expect her to leave here before midnight to go up to her constituency at uh, Finchley where we will go with her and where her um, agent, uh, Sir Roy Langston, who's a perky little man, looks rather like Arthur Askey, is promising to deliver a, 
Uh, the biggest majority she's ever had, uh, he says, something like 10,000 votes. Well, we'll see about that. We'll be going up there uh, with her before midnight. We expect her poll to be declared up there around about 1.30 in the morning. And after that, she goes back to uh, Conservative Party headquarters in Smith Square, either to the uh, ritual triumph, uh, as we've been saying, which awaits uh, a leader of a political party, duly anointed by the popular vote uh, as Prime Minister of a new government, or back to all the... Uh, inconsolable uh, feelings of defeat. Uh, that's what been, she must be going through now. Have, have you had any sign during the day or the evening of uh, how she feels things have gone? No, I, I think uh, she, uh, she, I thought was, she had a great gleam in her eye yesterday and as you know she has an eye like a gimlet when she said she was cautiously optimistic that she was going to win and uh, she certainly maintained that I think uh, uh, today. And but is the whole family down there with her? Yes, they're all here tonight, yes. It's, a it's just a family, family night. No one else in there, apart from family, as far as I know. A family night plus Michael Charlton. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be coming back to you, Michael. Thank you very right much there, indeed. Right. I think perhaps we ought to have a look at all those charts and boards that uh, Bob McKenzie has got there in a moment. But before we do that, maybe we just should check with Mike Cockrell whether he gave us the menu that the, the uh, Prime Minister had. He's now standing in the outside. I'm not quite sure what in Cardiff, Michael. It looks very grand. Where are you precisely? Well, this is the, uh, the Grand Edwardian City Hall in Cardiff. You mustn't call it the Town Hall. Um, the Prime Minister, I don't think that's him uh, in that uh, police car, is expected to arrive here in an hour. No, it's an ambulance just going past. Um, he'll be accompanied with his wife, who's been with him on the whole campaign, um, and his son Michael, and also Margaret Jay, who was, of course, the uh, wife of the British ambassador in Washington, who's flown over specially to be here. And I can say one thing about how many votes Mr. Callaghan will have. He told us this morning when he went to vote with his wife, he said, that's two votes I've got, assuming Audrey votes for me. <laughs> Audrey votes for him, but we don't know how Lady Wilson was going to vote. I wonder whether we shall discover that. Well, I think, um, although it is a, a very safe seat here, um, because the Liberal withdrew at the last moment in what the Labour Party are calling a piece of political treachery, and the Liberals had 8,000 votes last time, and Mr. Callaghan has only a 10,000 majority, there's a possibility that um, all those 8,000 Liberal votes could go to the Conservatives. But um, the Labour Party agent, who I've just seen, doesn't think that's very likely. But I did ask him what he thought of the result of um, the BBC's poll, and he said it's terrible, isn't it? He said if, after what, how well we've done, um, coming so far from behind, Mr. Callaghan does manage to pull it off and win, then clearly the, te the place I should take him to is the local swimming bars, because he'll be able to walk on water. We'll come back to you. Thanks very much. Well, now, let's um, have a look at some of Bob McKenzie's charts. He's got his phenometer there, the regional board, the marginals board, and, and a poll that we commissioned during this election from Derby North, which we'll be having after that. Bob? Well, let's remind ourselves of the task Mrs. Thatcher faces tonight. If she's going to unseat the government, let's look at the night, October 74 result. They had a three-seat overall majority. Now, if she gets only one, two, or three percent swing, this area, gray area, represents third and fourth parties. She still hasn't got an overall majority. She needs a four percent swing, at least to get a very small five-seat overall majority, and really a four and a half percent swing to get, say, a 20-seat majority. Now, that's only been accomplished once since the war. It's not as easy as it looks. It means converting net four and a half people out of 100, but it's not as easy as it looks. What do the polls say? Fascinatingly enough, when you compile them, put them together, average them, the final polls are saying this. A swing of 4.7% to the Conservatives. I said she needs four and a half. The polls are saying 4.7%. Remember, they've been more wrong than right in the last three general elections. Now look at our first poll from Derby North, an absolutely critical constituency, just in, shows these figures. A swing to labor of 0.7%. Now these constituency polls have been wrong too. We've had trouble with them in the past. But at the moment, they're pointing in a different direction from the overall average of the swings presented by today's on-the-day poll. If this is right, Callaghan is back uh, as the head of a government with a tiny majority. But don't place too much 
uh, emphasis on any particular poll because of their record and the fact that they're trying to operate. Really the problem is our elections are fought within the acknowledged margin of error of the opinion polls. And that's why they fluctuate all over the place. More of that later. Now I said Mrs. Thatcher needs a four and a half, half swing. She needs to knock out about this number of Labour seats, say 41. There are actually 50 on here. She needs to knock out that cluster of very marginal seats held by Labour in the Northwest. That cluster in the Midlands area and then a group here in the Southeast. That's where geographically the battle will be lost and won tonight. And you can look at it another way. Take them ranked by order of risk as far as the Labour Party is concerned. If there is a swing to the Conservatives, as I showed back there, these are the constituencies that go down. If one of us in a hundred changes sides in these constituencies, they go down. But Mrs. Thatcher needs 41 of these very marginal Labour seats. And there they are. And here's the fascinating thing. The 41st of them is Derby North. The one that our poll says she's not going to get. So th the drama is that 41 seats held narrowly by Labour must go down to the Conservatives to give a bare overall majority to Mrs. Thatcher. If she is to have a working majority, she must begin to knock off places like Leicester East, Bolton East, Halifax, and this row of places. So that is the real battleground in terms of narrowly held seats. If, on the other hand, our poll is right goes the other way, then these Tory narrowly held seats would begin to go down. But this is the story, and we'll check them off during the night. A blue rosette means they've been taken by the Conservatives. A check will mean they've been held by Labour. Here is where the battle will be lost and won over the course of the next few hours. Back now to David. Apparently we've, we've uh, just heard that the swing in Derby North is actually thought to be toward the Conservatives, despite what we were saying a moment ago, that it's been adjusted and it's thought that it may be a 2% swing to, uh, to the Conservatives. Anyway, we shall find out about that. Now down at Flood Street, something is... Something is stirring. A car has arrived, and I think to take Mrs. Thatcher up to her count at Finchley. Martin Young, our reporter, is down there. Perhaps he knows what's going on. Martin? Uh, yes, David. Uh, the cars have just arrived from Smith Square. We're, in fact, expecting Mrs. Thatcher to come out about ten past eleven or quarter past eleven, and uh, she'll be with all her family who are going up to the North London constituency. Uh, the cars are waiting here now. Her press officer, Derek Howe, is here, and uh, we'll let you know as soon as she emerges from number 19 and perhaps on her way to number 10. Who knows? This is Martin Young in Flood Street. During the election campaign, we covered Derby North, which Bob McKenzie was talking about a moment ago, quite thoroughly, because it was this 41st marginal constituency, the one that Mrs. Thatcher had to pick up if she was to get sufficient seats to give her straight overall majority over the rest of the parties. You may have seen some of the films we put out on Campaign 79. And uh, the candidate there, Philip Whitehead, a former television producer, and uh, he's the Labour candidate and he's got a swing of, what is it, 3.5 and a bit or so against him. Uh, if he's going to lose that seat. Now, during the election, for the last four weeks, reporter Bernard Falk has been in Derby North, and I think tonight he can at last get some of the people who wouldn't quite say which way they were going to vote or were trying to make up their minds to say how they did, in fact, vote. Bernard, do you have people with you now? Yes, I do, David. I can't afford a cigar as big as Robin Day's, but we have got a uh, half pint of bitter here in the bar of the sports centre in Derby and with me are three men and one lady and over the last four weeks they've been trying to make up their minds about which way they would vote, they've been listening to the issues and tonight we're going to know. Now Christine Brailsford, you're a housewife, you couldn't make up your mind, which way did you vote? I voted Conservative. Did you? I did, uh, yes. Why? What, what, what particular reason? Well, I felt we needed a change. Um, mainly David Steele was a little young, Mr Callaghan a wee, wee bit old but Margaret Thatcher was just right. <laughs> Thank you. Alec Ward, um, <laughs> local government officer, which way did you eventually vote? I voted Labour. I, I went for the father figure and for continued moderation. I see. And did you vote Labour last time or what? I did, yes. Right. So you, 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 you haven't moved away? You're just oh, no, I just definitely made up my mind it is Labour again. Right. Alan Castledine, now you were worrying very much about this issue. Which way did you go? I decided to go Conservative in the end. You've gone Conservative? 
Yes, it was either that or Liberal, and I felt that the Liberals didn't stand a great deal of chance, and if I voted Liberal, it was effectively a vote Labour, which I didn't want. Malcolm, which way did you vote eventually? Conservative in the end. And that is a change, is it? It is a change, yes. It right, so last we now know what our floating voters, in fact, did vote here in Derby North, and this is Bernard Falk returning you today. Bernard, just before we leave you, can, yes, we, find, can we find out when they made their decision? Yes. I, I know somebody, I heard of somebody today who went into the polling booth, yeah. got inside, couldn't make up their minds and left again. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, <we're> <laughs> I don't think that happened to Christine Brailsford. When did you make your mind up, though? Well, just about on the way to the polling booth, but uh, I did make it up before I got inside. Yeah, what about you, Alec? Uh, two days ago. Two days ago. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Alec? Finally, I think it was last weekend. I see, and you'd listened very, very carefully to the issues, I, I know that. Yes, but it was in the end that I didn't think Liberals would, and I didn't want Labour, so I voted Conservative. Malcolm, was it a last-minute decision for you? Exactly, last night, watching Campaign 79. I see. <laughs> well, we may have swung somebody, I'm not sure, David. Uh, in spite of the contradiction, anyway, over the, uh, the polls, we don't know whether, in fact, the, the BBC poll has gone Conservative or gone Labour. We're not sure about that. I'm sure that'll be clarified. But anyway, at least we know what uh, some of our floating voters now voted. Back to you, David. Somebody, somebody told me this morning that another person this was, that they'd, they were on their way to the polls to vote, and they passed two women, and that made their mind up for them. I never discovered what, what they did. They'd vanished before I had time to check. Well, during these election campaigns, the parties have every day, every morning, a big press conference. And curiously, the headquarters of the two parties, the Tory central office, and Transport House at Smith Square are opposite each other, just on the, on the corners, one opposite the other. And we've got people down at both, both places tonight. Vincent Hanna is at the Labour Party headquarters at Transport House. At Transport House, there's an air of slightly determined gaiety. And with me is Ron Hayward, the General Secretary of the Labour Party. Mr. Hayward, it seems a fairly high turnout. Does that surprise you, given the bad weather? I thought the weather would affect it, but it hasn't affected it. I'm very glad to know there's a good turn eh? That's what I wanted, and it's good for democracy, too. In a sense, you, you've no excuses to make, then. It's either it's a fair and square result, one way or the other. No excuses at all. We've had plenty of workers, plenty of helpers. The morale has been high, and the weather's been good. It's cold, but it's been good. Can I just mention to you the, the poll we heard from ITN earlier on, which predicts, uh, on uh, speaking to voters after they voted, uh, uh, 349 to the Conservatives and 257 to Labour. What's your view about that? Well, two things. You stop the poll, I understand, at 7 p.m. And that's their best time from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, so that uh, most of our people, a large amount of our people, would go along after that time. And, of course, so far, all the polls have been wrong that you've taken like this, and I'm hoping it'll be the same this time. Do you believe in polls as a professional? I have a very large bar of salt which I keep in the office to throw over both shoulders, you know, like everybody else, I like them when they're on my side and disregard them when they're not. Well, of course you pay good money out to... to yes, uh, indeed, we pay good Worcester. money, eh? but we don't pay it really to give us the result, we pay it so we can get the trends of what people are thinking and saying, so base their strategy on that, but to, we don't go the trend. Do you go as far as your employee in Cardiff who felt that the Prime Minister would be able to walk on water if he actually pulls off a victory? So, Mrs. Thatcher, we leave Ron Hayward for the moment. Mrs. Thatcher comes out, dressed in the most brilliant blue. We're just preserving judgment. Are you still cautiously optimistic? Yes, you, you are cautiously optimistic. Yes. You hear the polls are in your favour, Mrs. Thatcher? Thank you. The polls are in your favour. Yes. You've heard that the polls are in your favour, have you? Well, if ever anyone looked like a winner, Mrs. Thatcher looks like a winner this evening as she goes off to Finchley with her husband, Dennis, beside her for her count. I don't know whether she must have heard the, the, uh, the results of what our computer was saying and the results of what other people's computers have been saying and no doubt the results, perhaps the things that would influence her most, of her own reports from the constituencies, from her party workers standing outside every uh, count outside every polling station checking who's gone in and whether they've got the vote out and all the other things that they need and maybe it's a good moment in the sight of Mrs. Thatcher radiant in blue to go back to Ron Hayward and Vincent Hanna. Well in the sight of a very buoyant Mrs. Thatcher though Ron, I mean what do you feel about the comment of your employee in Cardiff? I was putting that to you. Do you think that the Prime Minister 
will be able to walk on water if he pulls off this campaign? I don't think he really wants to, although he was a sailor, but from what I remember in my Wesleyan Chapel days, I don't think it was uh, Moses that walked on water. I believe it was someone else. One of the things which um, I've heard from around some of the marginal seats is there may be a tendency for tactical voting in this election. Some of the younger Labour supporters might, in seats where the Liberals are second to the Conservatives, vote Liberal to try and deny Mrs Thatcher an overall majority. What's your view? What's, any, any feelings about Well, that? I can assure you there's been no direction from us on this tactical voting. This came up in a national newspaper. It may well be that sophisticated young men like of your age group may well do that, I don't know, but certainly my age group would say law to Labour. If people either come and vote Labour or they stay at home, and obviously they come out today. But curiously, sophisticated or not, uh, it is nevertheless the thing which could deny Mrs Thatcher an overall majority. Yes, indeed. And I wouldn't shed tears, of course. Well, um, the... BBC polls seem to suggest an overall um, majority for the Conservatives, so does ITN, and the result from Derby North seems to fluctuate. Do you think there's going to be a difference between a national swing and a swing in the marginal seats? Uh, what are your own personal findings from the professional I think there that? Could w I think there could well be different swings in different constituencies, but I don't think it would differentiate a lot. And I prefer, as you know, as you know the poll that's being painted right now than the ones you do and stop at 7 o'clock. How would you express your feelings then? Cautious optimism, cautious pessimism? Uh, well, I'm always a happy man, as you know, and I've been through a lot of elections. I very much want to win, of course, and uh, on the poll that uh, it, 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 it is suggested, a very good poll indeed, no one should shed any tears if the nation has decided one way or the other. We are a democracy, and the majority of seats will win, and that, that they will form the government. Ron Hayward, thank you very much indeed. And from Transport House, this is Vincent Hanna. Perhaps we should just find out uh, how things are going at Glasgow. It's just after quarter past eleven now. Glasgow, like all people thinking they may be first, are very optimistic about getting there first, and sometimes they say they'll be there sooner than, as a matter of fact, we suspect they will. However, let's go over to John Milne, who's our reporter there, and see if he has an estimation or an estimated time of arrival. John? Well, here in the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, we expect the Glasgow Central count uh, within the next few minutes. 11.30 is their best guess, but the boxes have been, in fact, a little late, so they may be delayed on that count, although I suspect the returning officer had some 15 minutes up his sleeve. 11.30 at the best guess, and this count should be very quick because it's the smallest electorate in Scotland. Fewer than 20,000 people are voting in Glasgow Central. And on the basis that the Labour member who's uh, seeking re-election, Tom McMillan, had something like 6,500 to his credit last time, this is a three-cornered fight and he should be in no great difficulties at all. So, 11.30, this is John Milne in the Kelvin Hall. Well, we will, of course, go straight over there as soon as we do get a real result coming up from Glasgow. In the meantime, perhaps let's just look back at other elections because traditionally this election night has always been one of the great occasions of the television calendar and tonight is the tenth television election that the BBC has covered. So while we re wait for these results, let's look back at some of the previous election marathons. They began in 1950 and even in those far off days, more than a quarter of a century ago, the team included this clean-cut young research student from Oxford, Dr. David Butler. But this evening we're going to show you some of the entertaining moments from two post-war elections, 1959 and 1964. And um, the voice that starts that particular evening off is one that I suspect may be very familiar to you. It is 9.25 on election day. The nation has voted. The count is on. <laughs> introduce my colleagues who are here in the studio. Up on the platform we have Robin Day who will be talking to candidates and people in the news up and down the country. As indeed will Cliff Mitchellmore 
who already has with him two very well-known figures from whom we'll be hearing tonight in the shape of Lord Boothby and Mr. George Woodcock. We also have our man about town who will be attending various election celebrations and is dressed for the occasion and we hope will come back in good shape to report on them. As far back as the 1959 results program, the election team included some brand new technology which had to be proudly unveiled. Something else happens to the results as well. They're passed down here into an electronic computer which we have nicknamed Ella. That's the girl, the big one down, standing down the end of the room. She's very complicated. The results go into Ella. They're sent in by the girls who work here. And in the end, they come out again up the other end of the room up here in the form of statistics, which nobody can understand except David Butler and his statisticians there. I hope I can understand them. It's my job, aided by Ella and uh, my friends here with their slide rules, uh, to try and uh, explain as quick, clearly as I can uh, what is happening in each case. Just as soon as you get the result from any individual seat, these lightning calculators, electronic and human, they'll give you the change in the share of the vote that each party has got. And from a very few results analyzed in this way, it should be possible to see very clearly which way the wind is blowing. The other half of our comment consists of a broader view of the political situation that's developing and the trend of the whole thing as it goes. For that, as I told you, we have Bob McKenzie. Bob McKenzie has behind him this vast scoreboard. I'm going to let you, Bob, explain what it does. Well, there's one I want to just mention in advance, and that's this one which indicates the swing of support from one party to another. It's extremely important to notice which way it goes. If the swing, for example, is one point consistently and on the average to the Conservatives, they're not only in again, but they'll have an increased majority of about 35. I feel that it's going to be 1945 all over again, if not even better. We'll have Mac out and he'll get kill in. In that year, BBC cameras were out in force to speak to the public. I am now going into the middle of it and hope that I'll come out alive. But we... Unfortunately, the public didn't always want to speak to the cameras. Sam? We're coming to you on the pavement in Leeds now. Now, Leeds is at present on its way to work, and not many people have time to stop even to give a view. Uh, Leeds being a working city, it's extremely difficult to uh, uh, grab anyone to give an opinion. Would you mind uh, giving an impression? What about you? I you? Yes, I beg your pardon. And now back to Richard Dimbleby in London. What's the matter? Haven't we shaved or something? Why do they, why do they like us so little? Uh, that, that persistent catcher of buses, Mr. Alan Wicker, is still standing on the pavement in Hammersmith. And I think, for pity's sake, we'd better go back to him there, yeah. don't you? Now, did you expect that the Liberals would have this resurgence? Yes, I did. It's become fashionable all of a sudden to become liberal. That fashion for liberalism had caught on in North Devon, where a young television interviewer called Jeremy Thorpe had just won the seat. Well, now that you're going into Parliament, do you think there's any likelihood of a light li liberal government getting in in your lifetime? Oh, I'm quite certain it's coming. Uh, we've seen, I haven't analysed the results very carefully yet, but we're quite clearly seeing the Liberal Party coming up and breathing down the neck of the Labour Party. Well, yes, of course, Mr. Grimman has said, hasn't he, that he hopes to replace Labour as the main yes. opposition party. But do you think that this run of Conservative victories will eventually impose some form of alliance between yourselves and the Labour Party? Well, that depends. I mean, uh, it's a historic fact, I think, that every radical party in time breaks up. This is what happened to the Liberal Party, and it may well happen to the Labour Party. As we've heard, the, the Liberals seem to have been going from strength to strength. But there's one Liberal who perhaps hasn't done quite as well as he hoped he'd do, and in fact the first loser we've interviewed, Mr. Ludovic Kennedy, who's failed in his second attempt to win Rochdale for the Liberals. He's in our Manchester studio with his wife, Myra Scherer, um, having their first meal for some hours, I imagine. Um, now, Mr. Kennedy, with the considerable increase in the Liberal vote in this country, aren't you disappointed that you failed to pull it off? Oh, of course I am, yes, of course I am. And just how disappointed are you? Well, I'm very disappointed. What more do you want me to say? <laughs> there were others in 1959 who had to admit defeat and concede the day. In the early hours of the morning, it was the turn of Hugh Gates. We have lost the battle, but the struggle continues, and in the end we shall win. So why was it that the Tories returned in that year with such a thumping majority? In the streets of London, one loyal subject had the answer. Let us give credit where credit is due. For the first time in parliamentary history, an unborn royal baby has swung the scales. 
I'm quite certain out of the uh, affection and love of, uh, of our Queen, many wish to see matters stay as they were, rather than put the strain of, of a political change upon her matters. In 1964, by which time Prince Andrew was already five years old, it was the leader of the Labour Party, Harold Wilson, who was called to Buckingham Palace and invited to form a new government. He arrives with Mrs. Wilson at the South Centre Gate. As I understand it here on the ground, if it's clear that he can form a government, he will kiss hands and leave the palace as Prime Minister. Well, do you feel like a Prime Minister? Quite honestly, I feel like a dream. <laughs> Got me with a sandwich. <laughs> Sorry. Being caught eating in the studio um, Ian, was a BBC you? ploy to prove to the audience that at least one presenter wasn't being starved. The 1964 programme brought a new presenter to BBC's election night, a man whose interviewing techniques have become his trademark. May I put to you some of the suggestions which are going around the city of London this morning, judging by the reports which we've seen here, that because of this situation and the small majority which a Labour government is likely to have, that you would be less likely to nationalise steel. Would you care to comment? I have already done it. My Good gracious me, Robin, you don't seem to listen. I do listen, I, Mr. Well, Brown. Well, then, you don't, then I don't know why you repeat the question. I haven't asked you that question I, before. Yes, but I have... You may be a member of the new administration, Mr. Brown, but I'm still entitled to ask you whatever questions I like, which yeah. are reasonable. If I may say so, you're also going all the way through my answers. I have already said that we will govern, and I think I'm repeating my words exactly, according to the mandate which we sought from the people, which the people have given us by however little a majority, and Mr. Day, that mandate included the public ownership of steel. Now, I did in fact say that. It remains true. Mr. Brown, thank you very much indeed. I look forward to interviewing you again. Thank you, Mr. Day. Uh, I hope when you next interview me, you don't interrupt quite so often. Uh, Mr. Brown, it is, a it is a little difficult interviewing somebody down the line, and uh, I hope that you don't uh, take it... It's quite a little difficult being interviewed down the line. I hope you don't take it, take it personally. Not a bit, Mr. Day. I like you immensely, but you must understand the rules by which we do this. May I call you brother? If you wish, Thank I would be very flattered and delighted. Goodbye, Mr. Brown. Goodbye, Brother Day. Well, nothing very much seems to have changed since 1959 and 1964, except that Rob Mackenzie's swingometer seems to have shrunk, rather, and David Butler has fewer friends. I can only count three behind him tonight. Now, we had another poll we did in Dumbartonshire East. This was the constituency in which only 12 people had to change their minds. Uh, 22 majority for the SNP there in October 74 when it was gained from the Conservatives and all three parties very nearly came out equal 31% 31% 30% and we did a poll there and this is what we're saying has happened SNP have dropped the Scottish Nationalist Party which has been uh, everybody has said has been much threatened in this election has dropped from 31% to 22% the Conservatives have gone 31%, 31%, pretty much to the same. And the SNP vote would have appeared to have moved to Labour, which was 30%, and now we're predicting will take the seat very easily, 41% to Labour, and the Liberals are down from 7 to 6%. Well, even lying for quite a large margin of error, and I think there may be in these post-polls, uh, that does mean almost certainly that Labour has won that seat for Margaret Bain, jumped from third to first place, it does mean that the SNP vote has plummeted down there, and if they've lost Dumbarton East by that sort of margin, they must be extremely pessimistic, I think, about almost all their, their Scottish seats, uh, except for perhaps Western Isles, where they may have confidence in holding on. The curious thing about the SNP's position is that they lose seats both to the Tories and to Labour, rather more to the Tories, isn't it? Yes, there are six, their, their six most marginal seats would all be lost to the Tories if they were lost, except for Dumbarton East. Five would go to the Tories, this one probably has gone to Labour. Labour the one, two ones that Labour's challenging in are really much larger margins, but on those figures, they too would go. What were the um, polls showing us uh, in Scotland at the end of, the, at the end of today? Well, they were all showing uh, the SNP down from roughly the 30% they were to something under 20%. There were conflicts between the polls slightly, and the Conservatives were up. They were up to rather more than the Labour Party uh, from their 1974 uh, figures. 
Uh, but there aren't actually very many seats at risk between Conservative and Labour. Only about three seats Labour could gain from the Conservatives, only about two seats the Conservatives could gain from Labour. It's a curious position because Scotland has so often gone a different way from the rest of the country, hasn't yes. it? Labour has needed Scotland. Well, the essential thing that happened in Dumbarton seemed to be the Scottish National vote went rather heavily towards the Labour Party. The Labour Party, in so far as it's under threat in Scotland, is under threat from the SNP. I think 35 of their 41 seats at the last election, the SNP came second, not the Conservatives. And from the Conservatives' point of view? From the Conservatives' point of view, well, they must obviously be very hopeful of picking up these three seats, uh, these six seats that they hold, or five of the six seats they were second to the SNP in, uh, but there are only about two seats that they could, I think, pick up from Labour. And one of them is Berwick and East Lothian, where they had a great disappointment in the by-election last year. But, of course, the, um, the position is that you may have Labour voters voting SNP to get the Tories out. I mean, oh, you may have tactical voting. We already had this discussion of tactical voting with Ron Hayward, and I'm sure we shall see some evidences of that in the relatively safe seats around the country. Um, I think, though, that Scotland is going to go on being very different and will not tell us very much or have a great impact. I certainly, in trying to guess at what's happening in this election, do want to see some solid votes from an English seat, and preferably an English seat, which is clearly at odds between the Conservative and Labour parties, not one of those ones where the Liberals come second, because it's rather complicated. Well, we, uh, we will be, during this programme, from time to time, separating region by region, so you can see how your own region is doing. That's what we're going to do now, and we'll be back again in a moment. Now, here in London, I should just say that the Northern Ireland viewers will also be with us right through, um, because they don't start counting until tomorrow. So in these opt-outs, we'll either go to Northern Ireland, as we will in a moment, for some comments on what's happening over there, or we'll look at the southeast, this huge region in detail, or we'll stick with the national story. But uh, Let's go for the moment to Northern Ireland. I think we've got a report coming up there from Billy Flax, who has been concentrating on that, and that in a way is a quite different election from anything that we've seen here. Let's go over there now. The biggest Northern Ireland party, that is the official unionists, are anxious to see another closely balanced parliament where they can exercise the maximum leverage to secure devolved government on their terms. They also want to strengthen their seven-member team of the last parliament, but in this they've been handicapped by split unionist votes. First they've been seeking to beat off a strong challenge to ex dormant Minister William Craig in East Belfast. This challenge comes from the Reverend Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party and the Alliance Party, who've been expressing firm confidence that Oliver Napier, their party leader, can snatch the seat, with the unionist vote split three ways, and with a local Labour candidate in the field as well. And in North Down, official unionists are trying to unseat Jim Kilfeder, the independent Ulster Unionist who sat in the last Parliament but who finally broke with the official Unionists earlier this year. Unionist hopes are centred too on Fermanagh South Tyrone, where former independent MP Frank Maguire has had to compete with another anti-Unionist, that is Austin Curry, former SDLP Chief Whip, standing as an independent. And Enoch Powell, Deputy Leader of the official Unionists in the last Parliament, now seems certain of getting back. A big poll in his South Down constituency has ruled out one threat to him, Unionist apathy. But the main anti unionist party, the SDLP, led by Jerry Fitt, is looking for a majority Labour government which could produce a strong political initiative in Northern Ireland. It will also be seeking to mobilise American and European opinion to bring pressure on Westminster, whatever the outcome of the election. Well, of course, the Irish votes, which we won't have counted, they don't actually start counting until tomorrow, um, will only be important if there's not a very clear cut, I mean, only important in the sense of what happens to the next government, if there's only a clear cut, yes. no clear cut result tonight. Now I think in a moment we'll be able to see the party leaders, I hope. Let's just see how things go. Well, welcome back, those of you who's been away, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher there and Mr. Callaghan, which one of them will be Prime Minister? That's what we're here to find out. It's uh, just after half past eleven. We don't have any sign yet of a declaration from Glasgow Central. We have heard that the first Welsh result, which was from Caerphilly, which was due at one o'clock, has been held up because apparently there's been a power cut where the count's been held and they can't actually get on with the votes. I'm told we may get Glasgow in a minute or so. That's the Glasgow Central result, which we were talking about a moment ago. That's a safe Labour seat. The SNP, though, came second of the poll, the Conservatives third. The SNP had just about 20%, just under 20% at the last election. And in the light of what 
we were saying about the SNP a moment ago, it'll be interesting to see whether they hold up or whether they drop down there in the centre of Glasgow as well. Well, indeed. We can give a, a lot of confirmation, but it is a very difficult seat. A quarter of the population has disappeared since last time, and I think it's not more than about 20 seats in the country that would be worse indicators of what was happening in Scotland, let alone in the country as a whole. We go straight to Glasgow Central now. We've got a result. Clear Thomas McLennan Macmillan has been duly elected to serve in Parliament as member for the constituency. And I make the majority there 6,608 compared with a majority last time of 6,444. And I understand. No great surprise there, of course. That's an absolutely safe Labour seat. Uh, the interesting well, thing, I think, of course, is that the Conservatives came into second place. Farouk talk Salim, to you all, all at one eight. time. There had to be a number of us trying to talk to you all at one time. What we did here there was Macmillan was back. Well, there was no surprise in that. His majority, they said, was 6,600 or so, which is only a few couple of hundred up on what he had last time. And we'll since, the electorate was, in the moment. since the electorate was much down, that does imply a substantial movement. We also heard that the Conservatives had replaced the Scottish Nationalists in second place. And since the Conservatives were behind, here are the full figures. So the full figures show the SNP have dropped to third place. The Conservatives have moved up to second in Glasgow Central. And the movement is from Conservative to Labour. I do think we can judge less in Glasgow Central than anywhere else. And you'll notice that the Conservative candidate, Mr. Salim, is one of the three coloured candidates for the election. We'll just show you how we can analyse these results. This is the share of the vote in Glasgow Central. The red box on the left showing that Labour took 72% of this constituency, the Conservatives 16, the SNP 11%. And we can then look at that another way, which is to see how it's changed since the last election in October 1974. Labour vote has gone up 9%, the Conservatives, the Blue, have gone up 3%, and the SNP vote has dropped 8%. And, and that's, that's our first result in this 1979 general election. There are 634 more results to come in. And if the whole nation behaved like Glasgow Central, then the Labour Party would be back in. But I don't think we should take that very seriously. On the other hand, we do have the Scottish national vote there, actual counted votes, as distinct from our poll, going down 8%. In our poll, they went down 10% in Dumbarton East. In this actual poll, they went down 8% in Glasgow Central, but it is a very different constituency even from last time. It's a terrible moment at the beginning of an election when you get one result like that, which is really so untypical, and we all have to deduce things from it instantly. I think it's a... Well, actually, I, it is I a long disappointment. Oh, this is my 10th or 11th election, and every previous one, one's been able to say, if the whole country behaves like then, this will be the outcome. This time, one really can't say this. I do not think that Glasgow Central tells us what has happened in the country as a whole, except insofar as it tells us that it looks bad for the Scottish nationalists, as the polls had been indicating. One longs for one of those old-fashioned results from Guildford. I don't know how Guildford's getting on in the moment. We may be able to find out. And uh, we were hoping that either... Guildford, where else were we that we thought would go? Salford was one of the places we thought we might get an early declaration from, but um, we have nothing for the moment. So we have one result in. Labour in Scotland holds a safe Labour seat. And uh, we might join Bob Mackenzie, who's got something to say, I think, about the whole Scottish National Party and their hopes and their fears on the basis of that result. Bob? Well, uh, on that first result, which tends to confirm recent opinion polls in Scotland, it does look bad for the SNP. They've had uh, this run of seats up to now and have been steadily improving their position over the last two or three elections. Remember that the seats they're likely to lose, if they lose seats, are eight of them are Conservative second place, three of them are Labour second place. So that if there is a loss of SNP, Curiously, it may be good news for Labour, even though overall in Scotland, on that first result, Labour looks like doing very well. But Labour runs second to the SNP in only uh, three of the total of 11 seats. Incidentally, four don't report until tomorrow, those four. But we'll be getting news of these terribly narrowly held ones, like the Barton East, where you may have heard our poll, which suggests that Labour's taken it, but we have to wait for actual confirmation. And that is the story we'll be watching for. And this will affect, of course, very much the whole possibility of a hung parliament. Remember, the idea of the Liberals and many others is we should have a parliament in which no one party has an overall majority. And if the SNP is badly hit, then they reduce the third and fourth party, a total of 39 in the last parliament. Incidentally, when people moan about the possibility of a parliament with no overall majority, I like to remind them that in the nine countries of Europe, only one has an overall majority for a single party, that's Ireland. So if it does happen here, it is not exactly a miracle in European terms back now to David. I hear that uh, 
the Tory party headquarters are very optimistic now that they've pulled this election off. I also am told that the um, count at Hove is going to take longer because of what's been described as a record turnout in the general election. They printed enough ballot papers for an 83% poll, but some of their polling stations ran out in mid-afternoon. There were people talking and there were some MPs complaining that in their constituencies, and we've had no reports of this happening yet, it may have happened, that in their constituencies many people voted at the same time when factories shifts changed and that there were already queues in the normal election outside the polling station that if they were going to have to vote in two elections, the general and the district at the same time, there would be queues so long that they would deter people from going to the poll at all. I don't know whether there's been any evidence of that. I've not heard that. Well, the evidence of turnout is quite... We've got quite a lot of odd reports in. 8% turnout up increase in Putney, 3% in Cardiff South East in the Prime Minister's constituency, 3% in Upminster, 5% in the two Salford constituencies. These are unofficial reports. But they do indicate quite clearly an increase in the 72% we had in the 1974 election. Frank Boff is down at Guildford, and Guildford was hoping to be first. They didn't quite make it, but Frank, um, when do you expect it now? Well, uh, there are 64 ballot boxes here, David, and they are now all on the floor. In other words, they stack them on the stage and hand them out, and they are now all on the floor being counted. Interesting to hear a discussion about the poll. Certainly here in Guildford, they were queuing, much to the surprise of the officials, at many polling stations at 7 a.m. this morning. And we have had some indication of an increase in the poll here. For example, the first box opened, indicated a 76% turnout. It was 71 in October 1974. And it settled down midway through the count at about, we suspect, 75.6. You know that uh, Robin Day was saying earlier on, the thrill and the excitement and the sense of fun and sense of history uh, as, as the democratic process uh, churns its way through. And that is nowhere more evident than here, of course, where a count is being made. And down here, scenes of tremendous activity, fingers flying all over the place as the count is made, as you can see. There are 115 counters here. They get paid, by the way. They get £5.50 if you're a normal table counter. And if you're a table leader, then you get uh, £6. And by the way, it's paid in advance. Many of the old hands from 1974 have retired, and there are lots of new youngsters uh, around the count here, as you can see, bank clerks and local government officials. Well, as I say, we're hoping very much uh, I'm just looking and now, as I say, all the, the, uh, all the uh, votes are now being counted on the floor, so don't go uh, too far away. We hope very much to have some news for you ere long. Well, I'm up here in the Salford City Art Gallery, the Salford East uh, votes are being counted here. In fact, the verification process, that's the checking out between the local and the national votes, took rather longer than they expected, more than an hour, and the final parliamentary votes have now been handed down behind me. They've just started counting them now. In fact, we were given a time of 10 to 12 as a possible declaration time a little while ago. That has now been extended. We're looking now about half an hour to 40 minutes away. Salford East still thinks it'll be pretty early. And the poll here is considerably up. It's 67.8, and that compares with 59.5 in October 1974. That's something of a surprise, especially since the weather, as you'd expect, in a city sitting next to Manchester, has been terrible all day. And this is Nick Clark in Salford. Well, here in Putney, they've been counting since quarter past ten. All the boxes are now out on the floor. It's been a fairly heavy poll here, something like 76.2% is the rough estimate, which is a good 6% up on last time. Uh, it's, as I say, been very heavy polling here, and we were expecting the result at something like uh, 12.45, but it now looks as if it will be sometime after one o'clock. This is Rodney Foster in Putney. Well, so some of the results are obviously going to be rather later than we thought. We were expecting a great bulge of results around about 2 o'clock. It may be more like around about 3 o'clock. But there are, in this election, going to be over 500, we expect, results in today. Uh, it's much more than normal. Um, Upminster, Bob Wellings, how are things going there, Bob? Well, we can tell you we have the official um, uh, turnout figure, David, and that's 79.3, uh, which is high. Uh, in October 74, it was 76% turnout. In February, it was 82. Uh, the count is absolutely rattling along. Um, just a, a little curiosity here, David, at the um, back of the hall, I don't know if you can see it, is a weighing machine, a marvelous weighing machine. Of course, legally, uh, the ballot papers have to be counted by hand and sorted by hand. 
but that is uh, just to check them, and so sensitive it, is it that if you put some... Um, I wonder if the candidates and their agents would be good enough to join me Ah, David, there's an announcement from the returning officer, uh, our first indication that uh, we might be moving very close to a declaration. We had heard that it might be five past twelve. Uh, this is the returning officer inviting the candidates to uh, join in, so that's the first hint for all of us that we might be within ten minutes of uh, a declaration. Uh, just to finish about the machine, if you put the ballot papers on it, 354 of them, um, it should weigh and report that much. Anyway, they've been playing with it. But the count is zooming along, and as I say, we could have a declaration at something like five past twelve. Bob Willings, Upminster. Who was it who said that votes in a democracy, the trouble with it was, they were counted, not weighed? Well, it doesn't look to me as though they're very close to a count there. I suspect the returning officer may simply have wanted them to look at some spoiled ballot papers and decide whether they were X's for one party or the other. It's a close result of the last election at Upminster, but... Um, it's a conservative marginal, conservatives hanging on there. They only need a tiny swing to Labour for it to go. So it could be a close result. It could be, it could be perhaps that they were, well, it wouldn't have been a recount yet. They, they seem to be still unfolding the ballot papers as far as I can see. Anyway, let's not bother about that for a moment. Let's go and um, talk at this stage. We will, of course, crash back again, as we always do, if we have an important result, or indeed any result at this stage of the night. And let's join some distinguished denizens of the press with Robin. And... Uh, I have with me um, Peregrine Worstall, looking at tomorrow's edition of the Daily Telegraph, the associate editor of the Sunday Telegraph, and Peter Jenkins of The Guardian. I don't know whether I can still call him journalist of the year, whether that was probably last year. Gentlemen, um, in your political guts, which are remarkably sensitive, are you convinced that Mrs. Thatcher is going to form the next government, Peter? It looks as if there's been a bit of a last-minute swing to Mrs. Thatcher, I think, judging by the opinion poll which was published at lunchtime. Until 1970, um, the normal thing was for there to be a rally to the government of the day in the last stages of an election. Since then, it seems that um, the tendency has been for the opposition party to do better in the closing stages of an election, in which case I should think she'll be in the Could I just majority. Uh, interrupt you for a second and go to Mrs. Thatcher? arriving at Finchley, uh, which is her constituency, with her husband to uh, be greeted by a mob of media men, including our own Michael Charlton. Well, how's morale, Mrs. Thatcher? Oh, it's all right. We hope to hold my seat. Is it all yes. right? Well, I'm sure you'll hold yours. <laughs> I am really confident. <laughs> you know, the results already decided. It's Good just that we don't know what it is. Thatcher. And I'll wait until I know. But uh, you said, you said nervous, yesterday you were... Of course, I'm always a fraction nervous. You said yesterday you were cautiously optimistic. That's you, just are you, are about you right, more cautious sir. or more no, optimistic? No, no. <laughs> just cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Thatcher. What sort of a day has it been for you? <laughs> Pretty hard work. It has all the last three weeks, hasn't it? <laughs> Charlton and Michael Charlton had more success with her than he did with the policeman outside her house. Peter, I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. You were going to say a slightly well, different from the last one. That it looks as if um, there's been a bit of a last-minute swing towards her, which should give her a comfortable majority. Um, Peregrine Westhorn, are you convinced that Mrs. Thatcher is going to form a government? I think it looks almost certain that she'll form a government. I, I think that we oughtn't to sort of dwell on... Mrs. Thatcher forming a government too much because of course it will be her forming a government but the the source of the victory if victory it is will really be conservative policies conservative ideas it's really to these that the swing has been and my feeling about the campaign really is that um, you mean they've won in spite of Mrs. Thatcher I, would, I was going to say it you said it for me I think that the the the, uh, the kind of ideas that she's been articulating are, are very popular now throughout the world proposition 13 in California swept the, the board in California, yeah. reducing, reducing taxation. I think the feeling against the trade unions is very, very strong. I think that these are the things will, which will have won the election, and in some ways, I don't think that she's articulated it particularly well, but in spite of her, nevertheless, I think that these ideas are going to sweep the board. Peter Jenkins, do you agree that uh, it's the Conservative policy and ideas rather than Mrs. Thatcher which has won, if she has won? <coughs> well, I think it's an election, been an election in which the issues have been extremely well exposed. And whoever w w wins this election, 
I think we'll, ha we'll have to respond to the messages which the people have tried to send to the government. One is that people clearly do want the state off their backs a bit. People clearly do want the taxes down. People clearly do want something done about the unions, if something can be done about the unions. So I think that a Conservative government will have a very clear mandate to try and do those things. But I think that should Mr. Callaghan find himself, after all, forming another government, he would have to try and do something about them as well. Do you agree with Peregrine Westall that Mrs. Thatcher hasn't perhaps articulated the ideas which appear to have been victorious, if the repose are right? Well, I think we, we might well get it on the record now, that it's, it is my opinion that she fought a less than brilliant campaign. So I think that if she, if, if she has won, and if she does win handsomely, um, it, will, it, 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 will, it will be to do with the things which Perry was mentioning, and, and, and not be to do, I think, with, 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 with the skill of her campaign, which I think has not been very good. Um, what do you think were the features of this campaign? Because it was different from others that I can remember. You, Perry, I heard the other day saying you thought it had been a very good campaign, whereas a lot of people found it a bit pedestrian, with no characters, no phrase makers, no larger-than-life people. No, I thought it was a good campaign in the sense that it seems to me that the choice for the electorate has been fairly plainly put to them. If they haven't got it after three weeks, that's their fault rather than the politicians' fault. There can be no doubt, I would have thought, at the end of these three weeks, what the choice is. It's between a party which says that uh, the government is doing too much and that more should be left to the individual, it, uh, against a party which says that the individual can't cope, the government's got to help, between a party that says the trade unions are too powerful and that the law must be brought in to reduce their power, and between a party which says the law is absolutely impotent in this field and there's nothing we can do about the trade unions except to hope for the best, etc., etc. And I think these issues have been fairly plainly put to the people. I think these are very difficult issues for the people to choose between. I think that, uh, that, that it's not an easy choice, but I think that the, insofar as politicians c can, can put their position clearly, they've done so. You so it's not been exciting, yeah. but I think it's been a true test of public opinion. No, I, think it's will been. I think it's been a very exciting election as well, because it, it, it had to be exciting to see whether Mrs. Thatcher was going to make it into number 10 as, of, as the first woman. So I think the contest between Jim Callaghan and Margaret Thatcher has, 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 has been a, a quite enthralling one. But I think it's also been a very good election, because I think that the, the argument has been conducted at a very serious and earnest um, level. Thank you very much. David? Well, as Mrs. Thatcher said, the result is already decided. The only trouble is we just don't know what it is. Bob McKenzie's got a clue over there. Well, actually, we've got to be very straightforward about this. There's been one result in only so far, in the very unrepresentative uh, constituency of Glasgow Central, where there was a swing from Conservative to Labour. All other discussion of swing to the Conservatives is hypothetical and based on the opinion polls. Now, I remind you, in 1970, five out of six polls predicted a swing in one direction that went in the other direction. So it is far too early, in my view, as our learned journalists have been talking about the certainty or near certainty of a conservative victory. Probable, betting odds favorable, by no means certain. Remember the task has not yet been pr shown to be uh, su uh, successfully accomplished, that is a swing of four to four and a half percent. The opinion polls, when collated together, say she'll get just about that. But they do not, so far, have any underpinning in solid results in a single English constituency. And I certainly wouldn't predict the result of this election until I've heard at least one result in something more representative than Glasgow Central. Back to David. Well, we've um, got this survey going on, which I don't know whether Angela has anything more on it at the moment, but we've been preparing through this election and we are now even now getting the results in and even now processing them. This guide not to how people have voted, which is something we shall know, but to why they voted the way they did, a proper attempt to try and discover what issues mattered and what people thought counted. So let's, while we're waiting for, while we're waiting for another result to come in, and we have only had one, though you wouldn't think it by the amount we've been talking so far, let's go over to Angela. Well, indeed, as David said, yesterday and today, in a specially commissioned survey all over Britain, Gallup has been polling a wide sample of people for us on the reasons why they voted the way they did. Now, the sample is a large one, and it included a special survey in Scotland. Voters were questioned in particular on the issues and personalities which persuaded them to vote the way that they did. So, these are the results of those well, that questions. Survey this morning in Beaconsfield. May I interview you, please? Can you tell me, please, how you'll be voting? Um, Conservative. Can you tell me, please, which party do you think is the best leader? Uh, Mr. Callaghan. And the best policies? 
really know. I haven't, you know, I'm going to think about it tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Can you tell me which party you think has the best policies? Conservative. And Obviously. the best leaders? Hmm? And the best leaders? Yes, definitely. Many, that, many thanks. Without a doubt. Thank you. Cool. Bye-bye. And which party do you think has the best policies? Conservative, without any doubt at all. And which party has the best leaders? Well, I think Mr. Thatcher is absolutely excellent, and I think the majority of the Conservatives are very good indeed. Thank you very but much. I do think Mr. Cullen has got this in for him. Which party has the best policies? Well, I favour Liberal. Li liberal on the whole. And which party has the best leaders? Well, of the three main leaders, I again, I go for the Liberal leader. Can you tell me which party you think has the best policies? I think Labour has. Really. And the best leaders? Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, Labour. Taking everything into account, which party has the best policies? The Labour Party. And which party has the best leaders? The Labour Party again. So these are the results of those questions. On which party has the best policies? 46% preferred the Conservatives, 37% Labour, and 17% the Liberals. Now, that's a better showing for the Conservatives than in some of the latest opinion polls. But when they were asked who would make the best Prime Minister, well, then their preferences switched around. On this question, Labour came out much better because 42% preferred Mr. Callaghan, 34% Mrs. Thatcher, and a very high 24% for Mr. Steele. Indeed, a feature of this survey so far has been the very good showing by Mr. Steele and the Liberals, a reflection, perhaps, of the campaign that he's been conducting. Now, on this chart, you can see just how Mr. Steele's personal popularity has grown through the campaign, leading up to that 24% today who thought that he would be the best Prime Minister. The issues which the voters felt were most important in the elections have emerged very clearly. There are five which seem the most important. Now, first come prices, with 42% saying that they were a key issue in deciding which way to vote. Then, in descending order, jobs, taxes, strikes, and law and order. Another feature of the survey has been the very different feelings up in Scotland about the election. The Labour Party shows much better there on policies, and even better on leadership. Taking the three most important issues, prices, jobs, and taxation, in England and Wales, and then in Scotland, about the same importance on both sides of the border was attached to prices and taxes. But there was a big difference on jobs, a major plank in Labour's campaign, and perhaps a key to why they've been doing better in the polls in Scotland. In England and Wales, 26% thought that jobs were a key issue, compared with 42% in Scotland. Perhaps uh, surprisingly, and we'll bring you more on this later, specifically Scottish issues, like devolution, came near to the bottom of the list. David. It's a curiosity about polling that a lot of it, almost all of it, is actually done by women. And some of the pollsters were doubtful about the answers they were getting when they said, do you believe that a woman should be or could be or is suitable to be Prime Minister of Britain? Because they thought it was hard for one woman to tell another woman that she didn't think that women as a whole were suitable to be Prime Minister, which would make Mrs. Thatcher's rating at 34% an exaggerated rating, which seems rather extraordinary, but that's what the pollsters say. Now, we've only had one result in so far, and that was from Scotland, and all it showed us was that the SNP's vote had dropped 8%, uh, and that was from Glasgow Central. That's the only result we've had in, but um, we're no nearer at this stage knowing what has happened in the election as a whole. We do, however, down at the Conservative Party headquarters, have the chairman with Richard Kershaw, the chairman of the Tory party, the man who was very close to Mrs. Thatcher right through this, a man of great experience in Tory party affairs, who sat next to her often at her press conferences. And I think he's there now, Lord Thornycroft, with Richard Kershaw. Uh, Lord Thornycroft, as party chairman, how does it look now to you as we're waiting for the results to start tumbling in? Well, uh, I'm old-fashioned enough to like to hear which way they actually voted, rather than which way everybody says they're going to vote. So but I'd like to hear a few more results. You're though. confident there, are you? Yeah, I'm... More, uh, th more than cautiously confident? I'm a bit more than cautiously confident. Have you ever had any doubts during this campaign, even when the polls looked a bit wobbly at the weekend? Well, I, I never make uh, very bold assumptions about uh, the opinion of the British people with large numbers polling, as I understand they did, and I think that's an excellent thing. What pleases me about the election is I do think 
the issues were put very plainly to them and really rather well and powerfully put to them. You were pleased with your campaign? Yeah, I was pleased with the campaign. I thought Margaret Thatcher put her case really magnificently with absolute clarity. It was the area of where, how far the state should uh, really involve itself, how far the individual and the rest. I thought she put that very well. Whether you could leave everything just to chance and a free-for-all with the unions or whether some reform of the law was necessary, all those points were fairly put. Thank you, Lord Thornycroft. This is Richard Kershaw at Conservative Central Office. I think in a moment we may have a result from Cheltenham. We're told there'll be one coming in three or four minutes from there. That's a safe seat. It's been Conservative since 1918, Charles Irving, the MP. But that would be an interesting indication of how things were going, but for the fact that the Liberals came second in, Chels in Cheltenham, so we won't have a straight Conservative Labour swing there. But um, we don't quite know when we'll get that. At that stage, may, maybe have the first of Angela's summaries of the story so far, though you've probably been able to follow it so far just as well as we have. But here Angela is all the same. Angela? Well, we can certainly say that we've got one confident prediction so far. There's been a big turnout. In spite of some chilly weather, the first returns indicate that it's 75% in the northwest, and there are similar figures for many other parts of the country. Well, the honour, as we saw, of the first declaration went to Glasgow Central, which has the smallest electorate. It's a Labour stronghold, and Tom McMillan was returned with a majority of 6,600. The Conservative, Farouk Salim, was second with 1,900 votes, and the SNP share of the vote was down 1,400 votes from 1974. Mr. Callaghan is now in Cardiff, where he voted this morning at a polling booth in his constituency. Some time after his result is declared, in just under four hours, he plans to return to London. While Mrs. Thatcher, of course, as we've seen, is already in the capital. She voted this morning near her home in Chelsea. After the declaration in her constituency of Finchley, she'll be at Conservative headquarters to hear how the party as a whole is doing. In Scotland, David Steele was an early voter at a polling booth only 30, 30 yards from his home on the Scottish border village of Etterick Bridge. And after his result, the Liberal leader intends to stay in his constituency. Meanwhile, it's reported that the wife of the SDLP candidate in Belfast North was held up by masked men tonight and her car set on fire. Police said the woman was unhurt, though shocked. And in Italy, on the eve of the general election campaign there, a terrorist group attacked officers of the Christian Democratic Party in Rome and killed a policeman. Tonight, in Rome and Milan, there were protests over the attack, which had also left two policemen critically injured. And here at home, customs officers have seized two million pounds worth of heroin at Harwich. A number of people are helping police inquiries. And finally, let's go back to the count. And in the Caerphilly constituency, a power cut has caused chaos for officials getting ready to begin the counting. It happened as ballot boxes were being brought in to a sports centre at Hengoad, and police began an immediate security check. The Caerphilly result was due at about one o'clock, one of the first in Wales, but uh, it may now be delayed. David. Apparently, the... Uh... 1,185, and that the undermentioned person has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency, Charles Graham Irving. Which means, of course, that the Conservatives have held the seat, but the Liberals Well, we seem to have lost the sound from Cheltenham. We shall have the figures straight away. But that was Cheltenham coming through on the radio. That's the second of our results. A safe Labour seat, Conservative since 1918 and in a moment or two we'll get the result from there and be able to see what the um, swing was. David? That was, that was the Cheltenham result, Charles Irving was elected. It wasn't actually Conservative since 1918, of course from 1937 to 1950 it had an independent... A national member. independent candidate, quite right. He was, yes. was genuinely independent, he yes. defeated a Conservative in 1945. But, uh, no, it is a pity we didn't hear the figures there. It's no surprise that Mr Irving's elected. We wait breathlessly to see the detailed figures. Here are the, here are the full figures. Uh, conservative majority of 10,538, that's up from 8,454. The Liberals still in second place, 15,000, their vote up in Cheltenham. And the Labour vote way down from 12,000 to 9,000. National Front, who is a new candidate, not getting many votes and of course losing his deposit. I should just say one thing about this picture. The little white dot shows you where Cheltenham is. Well, that's a very interesting result. The Conservatives are up almost 5%, the Liberals are up 2%, which shows that David Steele's theory that they would do, do well in their own seats uh, is reasonable. They're certainly doing better than they did last time. Labour down 7.5%.
Perhaps there's some tactical voting there. Nonetheless, if that is an indicator of what's happening nationally, it is an indicator of quite a strong tie to the Conservatives. And here's the share again, 51% Conservative, 30% Liberal, Labour 18%, National Front 1%, and the change, and which doesn't show the National Front because they weren't there last time, and you can see the Labour voters down, right down 7%, the Conservatives up 5 the Liberals up 2 and that tactical voting that uh, David was talking about being people not voting Labour, but voting Liberal instead this time. Yes, but nonetheless, the Conservative vote has gone up, and they must have got their vote from somewhere, uh, and if, even if Labour people switched to Liberals, some Liberals must have switched to the Conservatives there. The National Front got only 0.7, they put down as 1%, it was even less than 1%. There's no sign of any breakthrough in that direction. There's the Chancellor of the Exchequer, whether he'll be a Chancellor of the Exchequer by tomorrow morning, we shall see, up at Leeds, where his count is. He and two other prominent politicians are there in Leeds, and they, each of them have fairly safe seats. It's an extraordinary place. It has Sir Keith Joseph in Leeds East, in uh, Leeds Northeast. It has Merlin Rees in Leeds South, and it has Dennis Healy in Leeds East. That's the Civic Hall there, where the, all three counts are done, and we should be going over there for those. Well, David Steele will be, I should have thought, rather encouraged by the increase in the Liberal vote. He said during this campaign that though what he wanted was not to form the next government, well, it would have been pretty silly if he said he was going to form the next government, it wasn't enough just to get this wedge of 20 Liberal MPs. He wanted the Liberal vote to go up everywhere, the popular vote to go up as high as it could, and urge people to vote Liberal, even if they didn't have a hope of winning, to give moral authority, as he put it, to those Liberal MPs who did go back into Parliament in the event that there was a hung Parliament and the Liberals held the balance, because, of course, what he has all along said he wanted, his tactic was that there had to be change in the constitution of Britain in the way we vote so that we had more moderate governments as he put it and he wanted to and we shall see later on tonight whether he'll be in any position at all to get guarantees or copper bottom guarantees one of his colleagues John Pardo called it that there would be a change in the voting system so that it represented more accurately the popular vote when we'll incidentally be looking at the way the people of Britain as a whole have voted uh, as the evening goes on and we shall see what happens to the liberal vote and how many people vote and how many MPs they get as a result of the way people vote. Briefly, David, we're going to schedule so All the polls have been suggesting a swing to the Conservatives. There are two comforts in the results, the two results so far for the Labour Party. One, the collapse in the SNP vote might enable them to pick up one or two vote seats from the Conservatives if the SNP votes have been going to Labour in Scotland. Secondly, this holding up of the Liberal vote may indicate tactical voting and that the Conservatives won't be making the gains they were hoping from the Liberals. So this may slightly reduce the advantage to the Conservatives from, uh, that they would get from a normal swing. Uh, your, your study of the 1974, October 74 election, showed that, if I remember rightly, a handful of people, 35,000 people or something, who would normally have voted Labour, I think it was in that case, by, 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 who would normally have voted Liberal by voting Labour, or who would normally have voted Labour by, vote, by voted Liberal, actually changed the result considerably. I think there are, but there were 20, 25 seats which probably were affected by people voting in this relatively sophisticated way of not de deciding not to waste their vote, but to cast their vote in the most efficient way to keep out the man they disliked most. And Tories, for instance, voting Liberal to keep Labour out? Yes, certainly there are cases like that, Cone Valley and Rochdale and so on. But when, when you've got a campaign that's been fought like this one, it would surely be unlikely for many Tories, at any rate, to be voting tactically, even if they were in a bad position. I mean, they'd well, feel they had to come to the support of the party and said the popular vote was high, wouldn't they? Not to vote tactically in that way, but if they were slightly losing faith in their party, but they didn't want to go all the way to the other side, there's that sort of switching. But no, I think the tactical voting is much more something that you expect the party that comes third, and the whole that's Labour, in seats where the issue is at stake. Well, Robin Day has been elevated to the House of Lords, so we better not delay him any longer. Robin? I have got three members of the Upper House with me, which is rather different. Lord Helsham, former Lord Chancellor, who may well be the next Lord Chancellor. Lord Pert, Lord Privy Seal and Leader of the House of Lords for the time being. And Lord Avery, victor of the most celebrated by-election of uh, the post-four years, that of Orpington 17 years ago, which gave us a very good television programme that night, I remember. Lord Helsham, do you, on the basis of what we know, feel confident now of a Tory victory? I never like to predict results, but I've got a sort of gut reaction, I think the phrase is, that we're going to win. Lord Perry, are you resigned to going out of office? No, not yet. After all, uh, we've only had two results. I want to see more details. 
Um, Lord Avery, you must be uh, very pleased with the Cheltenham result, haven't you? I think the Cheltenham result was quite creditable, and we were a couple of percent up in a seat that we didn't obviously have any hope of winning. <coughs> uh, but I agree with others who say that this is far too early, and you can't draw any conclusions on the basis of one or two results. Granted that it's too early, let's uh, take the benefit of your experience on this campaign. What sort of campaign do you think it's been compared to the others you've taken part in? What, going back? What was your earliest general election campaign? 1924. Did you utter in 1924? Yes, I've spoken at every general election since 1924. What did you say in 1924? Oh, I can remember it very well, but I'm afraid it would bore you. But it was really I'll stop you if you bore me, but you never have. <laughs> I was going to make a wonderful peroration about the red flag and the Union Jack. And the old brute who went on in front of me <laughs> made it first. Oh, how old were you then? <laughs> Seventeen. <laughs> well done. Lord Pett, uh, what do you think of this campaign compared to others you've uh, seen? Well, it's been a very polite campaign, good-mannered, and uh, the audience has been, I think, uh, interesting to uh, talk to. I, I've been all over the country, north, east, south, west, and I've found uh, people anxious to hear Don't the argument. Do you think democracy needs a little more than politeness? Oh, no, I Only think... Perhaps it, fire in people's bellies well, and so I think politeness is very important. So and, do I. And I think the campaign, is, the campaign has been a good campaign, and I think uh, my party leader, uh, the Prime Minister, has fought a good campaign. Whether, in the end, uh, results are not to our liking, I, I can't say yet. Do you agree with the general view that whatever his result may be, Mr. David Steele has fought a, a campaign which has done him credit? Yes, I think so. I think he's done very well on television. What do you want to say there, Eric? Well, I think he undoubtedly has done extremely well on television, but what's interesting to me about the campaign is that it took off at a very uh, slow rate, and that right up until last week it appeared that people weren't terribly interested. Now we hear these um, tales all up and down the country of enormous turnouts, and I do get the impression, uh, and I have had this impression on the doorstep also, that suddenly the thing came alive, and I'm not quite sure why. And uh, may I just say that the Conservatives have held Torbay. Does that uh, strike you as profoundly significant, Lord Helsing? It doesn't altogether surprise me, Robin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been rather shocked had some <laughs> other conclusion been reached. Let me go back to Eric Glover. Uh, don't you think it might be fair to say that although David Seale has fought a very creditable campaign in his manner and so on, but it's been uh, rather easy for him to just say the other two parties have made a mess of it and we could make a size of moderating influence with hardly discussing liberal policy for I the gut issues of the day in as great detail as the others because he knows he won't have to carry it out. And the, the proposition that the other two parties have made a mess of it is fairly obvious, but the um, next step in his reasoning I think has taken a, quite a lot of putting across and that is that the best solution for the British people is not to have one or other of the Conservative or Labour parties continuing in office without any check on them uh, from the mm. people at large, and that the best result would be uh, if they had to govern with the consent of another party. I go to David Dimbleby for a Guildford result which is said to be imminent. Well, I don't know about Guildford. We've got, we've got, first of all, the Torbay result. It's been held with a great increase in the majority, up 11%, 8,000, that's Sir Frederick Bennett, who's been the MP there since 1955, a friend of Rhodesia and South Africa, a conservative stronghold. The Liberal vote has dropped 5% or so. It's the first ecology candidate, too, getting 1,000. But we go to Guildford now, where the declaration is imminent. Twyford, being the acting returning officer for the Guildford constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Paul Hampden Blackborough, Labour, 11,689. Henry Donnelly, Liberal, 11,673. David Arthur David Arthur Russell Howard he's the conservative candidate D David Arthur Russell Howell 31,595 
tremendous increase in his vote. It was 25,564 at the last general election. His majority then was 10,904. We still have one candidate to be declared, Peter Scott. Peter Gilbert Scott, 232. So Labour so goes here at Guildford. second in Guildford and Liberals fall to third place in the poll and David Howell's majority goes up by over 6,000, increase of 15%. That's David Howell, who's the opposition spokesman on Home Affairs and was at the Treasury and is expected to have a job in a new cabinet if Mrs Thatcher is forming a cabinet tonight. The first of our results from the South East and the Conservatives up 8% there the Labour Party down only 1%, the Liberals down 7%, rather different from the position that we had in Cheltenham, where it's rather a similar sort of result the previous time. This time Labour has pushed up in second place, the Liberals have collapsed rather considerably there, and the, uh, it depends on how you count swing, but if you actually say the net change between Conservative and Labour is in fact uh, 4.8%. 4 4 it's just the sort of thing that would put Mrs Thatcher in. Now the result from Upminster. The returning officer has just walked away from the microphone, but he was there a moment ago, and I think we should have that in a second. Bob Wellings is down there. Uh, yes, as you say, uh, David, uh, the returning officer, he's returning again, and uh, we look like right. we look Ladies like we have a declaration. I'm now in a position to announce the result of this count for the Havering Upminster constituency. The votes cast for each candidate of this election are as follows. David Harvey, 5,216. John Warren Loveridge, 27,960. William John Neary, 965. John Kent Stevenson, 18,800. So the Conservatives have held this marginal with a greatly increased majority. I don't think he's quite finished giving the figures. About a 7%, about a 7 swing, I guess. John Warren Loveridge, duly elected for the Havering Upminster constituency. Well, John Loveridge has been the MP there since February 74. It used to be a marginal seat, and uh, he's now turned that into a fairly safe sweet, uh, seat with a swing from Labour to the Conservatives in this East London seat of 7.8 percent which if reflected all over the country would give would, would Mrs Thatcher a, a majority of near to a hundred people did think that London might swing rather faster than other places here are the full figures you can see them an 80.4 percent turnout that's up four percent on last time but this very big swing to the Conservatives the Conservatives show the vote up ten percent and here you can see the change the Conservatives up ten percent then they're, they're taking it relatively evenly from Labour and Liberal. Now, on this, coupled with the other two, I do think it is fairly clear that Mrs. Thatcher is going to have the largest number of seats, and I would have thought it was virtually certain that she is going to have a clear majority. So that is the first result in with a clear swing, a straight swing between Labour and Conservative from London, and it's just under an 8% swing, which will give Mrs. Thatcher, if that's repeated all over the country, which there's no reason to suppose it will be at this stage, a majority of 100 or so in the House of Commons. And we now have a result, I think, coming in a moment from Salford East. That's a safe Labour seat, but uh, the swing there will be interested. In the meantime, Bob? Well, there are two results that really matter where we can make, begin to make an estimate. In one case, the swing Labour to Conservative is 4.7, just on the edge of what Mrs. Thatcher needs for a bare overall majority. The second one, 7.8 for the Conservatives, which gives her a very substantial overall majority. I think the betting odds are now very strongly there will be a Conservative overall majority. But we have two results of great importance, and I do think they point powerfully toward a change of government. We hope in a second to go across to Salford East, which I can see with a lot of people peering at figures and leaning over the returning officer and no doubt checking them. This is Frank Alorn's, uh, Frank Alorn's constituency, I think, is being counted first. In fact, if you look carefully at the gentleman in spectacles with the red rosettes on, the one on the right, I think, is Frank Alorn. And our reporter, Nick Clark, is up there. Nick? 
Yes, I don't quite know what the delay is at the moment. We've um, had some indication of the figures. The swing that would be needed actually to remove Frank Alorn from his seat would be 16.4%. That doesn't sound very likely. Um, and we think that the, his majority may have been slightly reduced. We're not quite sure what the hold-up is. It should be due any second now. Frank Alorn is a Tribune Group member. He sits on the NEC of the Labour Party. You always see him at conference. Um, sitting on the, ta on the top table and he said during this election campaign or in April rather just before that if the Tories came to power they would want war with Russia which their defense man Ian Gilmore said was the smear of all smears anyway Frank Alorn has a straight fight this time with the Conservatives which will help you a bit won't it? There was yes. a Liberal there last time wasn't there? That should help him the, top, the electorate has gone down by a fifth since last time and it isn't probably a very good indicator as a seat, nonetheless it is the first seat from that part of the country and will be a massive indication of whether the North and the South are behaving differently as some reports were suggesting during the campaign. We also have a result coming up in a moment we think from Glasgow Govan. It's said to be imminent. Let's just go over there and see if John Milne's got any news. Glasgow Govan we expect very soon indeed. Uh, the scrutineers again are on their last survey of the count and uh, this is the seat which uh, featured Margaret MacDonald in 1973 when she intruded into what was a safe Labour hold at that time and took it for the SNP. That of course lasted only until February 1974 when it was snatched back for the Labour Party again by Harry Selby who held the seat once more in October 1974 with the majority of almost 2,000. Mr. Selby has decided to stand down at this election and he's been replaced by a local councillor, Andy McMahon, who again is expected to hold it for the Labour Party. There are only three candidates in the seat this time, a Conservative, Jack Walker, and for the SNP, Tom Wilson. The for, the Salford, for the Salford East constituency, hereby give notice that the to total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Frank Julian Allon, Labour, 13,453. Stephen Reed, Reed Latimer, Conservative, 7,597. And that the undermentioned person has been duly elected to serve as a member for the said constituency, Frank Julian Alon. Well, a thoroughly expected result for Frank Alon there. But as we were hearing in the studio, his electorate has shrunk considerably since last time. It's down by nearly 7,000, and since that's mainly through slum clearance, one must assume that that is very largely Labour voters which have left the, left the constituency. So his votes held up pretty well, really. And now Nick Clark, Salford East. Well, that's the first result we've had from the northwest, Salford East being just to the west of Manchester. And that was a 2.5% swing only. Far less, 2.5% swing from Labour to the Conservatives, which wouldn't give Mrs Thatcher what she's looking for tonight. No, there's a 5% increase in turnout, but it's very, it's very difficult to judge from that seat. We've been very unlucky in the seats we've had from so far. You can, see, you can see the percentage change, and the Conservatives go up 9%, Labour goes up 4%, that's a difference of 5%, half it, you get 2.5% for the swing. That's due to the fact there was no Liberal candidate this time. Maybe an indication of where the Liberal votes were going, but I suspect there was some straight switch from Labour to Conservative. Call, call for each candidate at the election was as follows. Glasgow governs Andrew a long Andrew McMahon, Labour Party candidate, 11,676 votes. John Harrison Walker, Scottish Conservative, 3,188 votes. Thomas Wilson, Scottish National Party, 2,340 votes. 2,340 votes. Ballot papers rejected 34. And I declare Andrew McMahon has been duly elected to serve in Parliament as member for the constituency.
so the Labour Party Mr. maintained their hold Walter. on Glasgow Govan. And Andy McMahon continues the tradition of Harry Selby having taken it back from the Nationalists. The Conservatives moving into second place there. A fairly high turnout for a seat which has lost a lot of its electorate because of redevelopment and some clearance. But Govan safely back in Labour hands. This is John Milne at the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow. What's interesting there on those results is the SNP is virtually wiped out in Glasgow, Govan, down to 2,300 from 9,400 at the past election. Bill Miller is up in Glasgow who studies Scottish elections. Bill, what do you make of these SNP results we've had so far and what do you think the picture is going to be in Scotland at the end of the night as a result of them? Well, first of all, I think we really have to discount the results in Govan. The reason why we've had Glasgow Central and Glasgow Govan coming in so soon is because they've got tiny electorates. Both of them, in fact, uh, have lost a uh, fifth of their electorate since the last election. And in Govan, in particular, I think there's still a declining effect, a wearing off of the effect of Margaret MacDonald at the by-election. There was, in fact, a 22.9% swing from the SNP to the Labour Party in Govan, but I don't think we'll see that repeated throughout Scotland. So I would discount Govan entirely and go more on the basis of Glasgow Central. On that basis, the SNP would lose four seats, and both of the other parties, Labour and Conservative, would gain two. So we're talking at the moment on the basis, really, of only one result, and that in a safe Labour constituency, of that relatively modest change. Good. Well, we'll be coming back to you later on when we've got a bit more of a result there. But you think Margot MacDonald was a kind of very powerful candidate and without her really the vote collapsed? I think we that? often see with uh, by-elections where there's a spectacular success that it takes quite a long time, maybe 10, 15 years, for the effect to finally die away. And we're seeing something of this effect dying away. Could I just, before you go back to London, pick up one point that was made by Angela Rippon? She said, when analysing the survey that you've done, that devolution was not important to Scottish voters. I should say that in the Dumbarton East survey, we asked people what should be done about devolution now, and however unimportant they felt it was, less than 30% felt that devolution should be dropped. And that in a place where our survey showed that the SNP member was going to lose her seat. So you should not identify too closely, I think, the success of the SNP and the demand for devolution. Good. We have another result from Hamilton. Come in. Labour holding Hamilton. And again, the SNP dropping to third place. Their vote dropping 22% from the by-election. And here you see the change, uh, which is the change 22% down, sorry, from the last general election, and it's uh, down rather less from the by-election, which was the great disappointment for the Conservative, for the Labour, the SNP, in the middle of last summer. Labour is in fact 12% up on last time. Well, Margaret MacDonald's up in Glasgow. What do you make of what's <coughs> happened so far? The seat that you won in that by-election, the SNP doing so hopelessly. Is it you, Margot, who... Uh, failed to deliver a vote there. When you went away, the vote collapsed, rather? Um, yes, that was a bit confusing. Um, <laughs> well, let me say it again. Is it because you weren't there to get the SNP vote out that the SNP vote collapsed? Oh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Go because on we had you. good candidates in both places. I think probably um, there is a swing against us. We know that. I'm just delighted some folk voted for us. What do you think is going to happen in the rest of these seats? I mean, we were well, hearing... Well, I think from it's going to be very patchy, you see. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to look at Scotland as a whole because there hasn't really been a central campaign here. And I think that in areas of Scotland where Labour are strong and where they were previously strong, they're possibly going to strengthen their position. And the same possibly true for the Conservatives and for ourselves in the areas where we've been strong. But how much were you damaged by the referendum on devolution and all that? I mean, it must have been rather a blow to you just before a general election to do so well, not to do as well as you'd hope to do on devolution. No, we started dipping in the polls a very long time before the devolution referendum took place, in fact. And I think it was more of an effect on our activists, because I think they were a bit sick. We voted yes in Scotland, remember, and we didn't get the assembly. Thank you very much, Margaret MacDonald. Well, we've got Salford West imminent now, the other Salford seat, and also a swing, I'm told, of 6.3% from Labour to Conservatives in Surbiton, yes. Sir Nigel Fisher's. Bigger. There's the Surbiton result. It's a, it's a safe Conservative seat, and uh, Sir Nigel Fisher is a prominent backbencher and a member of the 1922 committee. The interesting thing is that links 6.3 percent. Again, it's enough. And now we go over to Salford. Now we go over to Salford West.
the Salford West uh, count taking place next door in the Lowry Gallery, in the City Art Gallery, and it should be coming any moment now. We've, of course, a standing member and for the last 15 years there has been Stan Orme. He's the uh, Social Services Minister, Privy Councillor and Cabinet Member, and he's got two opponents this time, the Conservative James Markwick, who's uh, an executive for The Guardian, lives in London, but did in fact work up here for 27 years, and a Workers' Revolutionary Party member, Stuart Carter, he's a 22-year-old. Well, there's a clear swing in the country, or beginning to emerge. I don't quite know what, we'll have to see what it looks like. You saw it in this constituency when we walked around 10 days ago. Has it been any different the last two few, few days? There's a swing to the Tories. How, mu how much? I don't know yet. We'll see when the votes are counted. Okay? Thank you. Well, I was hoping we might be able to tell David Owen before he whisked off what the swing was. What's it running at, David? Well, on the six seats where you can talk about it at all, it's only 2.5 for the Conservatives. They're not representative six seats, though. Right back to Salford. I, the undersigned, being the returning officer for the Salford West constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Stuart Michael Carter, Workers' Revolution, 383. James Charles Marwick, Conservative, 11,157. Stanley Arm, Labour, 18,411 and that the under-mentioned person has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency, Stanley Orme. Okay. So Stan Orme is safely re-elected there. It looks as though his majority at uh, around 7,300 is slightly down on last time, and he'll be disappointed about that because he'd rather hope that with the Liberal being removed from the poll, he would in um, fact pick up on his eight and a half thousand majority of last time. Not much officer, success for the Workers' Revolutionary Party there, as you can see, only just 300 votes. But Stan Orme is safely back. And now back to the studio. For a very difficult job. Former Minister for Northern Ireland there making his speech, as all successful candidates do. We don't normally stay with them because we think these figures are perhaps more interesting to you. Um, they thank all their party helpers and party workers and they thank the people for the way they did this count and those were the figures. Perhaps we should just see them again for a moment because I was talking over them. Let's just see Stanley Arms out. There we are. 18,000 and uh, his majority down just a thousand or so. A swing of 2.2 percent. It was 2.5 percent in the other Salford seat. This has lost less electorate so it's probably a better guide. The interesting thing is there was 14 percent voting for the Liberal Party last time and either the Liberals are giving their votes to Labour or there is a very much lower swing in the North than in the West. If the Liberals are mainly voting Conservatives, as Conservatives have thought, then in fact there was no real movement between Conservative and Labour. And this may give some slight comfort for the Labour Party. Here we are with eight results in, which we can make a comparison on, and the net swing to the Conservatives is 2.6%. We have another London results in Mary Laburne, which has been held. Again, it's a safe seat by the Conservatives. A much smaller swing from Labour to the Conservatives, only 3.6%. Conservatives, the same order of the polls, Labour second, and the Labour vote is down a bit, the Conservatives up a little bit. And uh, the Ecological Party there again, with 691, they fielded over 50 candidates this time. You may have seen they had party political broadcasts. We'll be keeping an eye on the way that they do. And the National Front bottom of the poll with just 1% of the vote. David, I've got a key piece of news. There's been a recount in Nelson and Cohn, an absolutely key margin of the sort that the Conservatives have got to get on that list. There is a recount in Nelson and Cohn. We're able to look at these uh, votes uh, that, are, that are cast in various ways, and we have one way, which is to look at the national share of the vote. Now, after 11 results, well, it may be nice for those who cast their votes in those 11 results to know that they're there, but that's how it... Uh, that's how we show these figures, the popular vote, and then we can show the share as well. And the interesting thing here will be whether the party that wins at the end of the night does have the largest share of the vote. It doesn't always happen. It didn't happen when Ted Heath lost in February 74. At that time, the Conservatives had the larger share than Labour, even though they had fewer seats. And it'll be interesting to see also what the, Lab the Liberal Party does. And this is how it is at the moment after those 11 results. The Conservative vote up 9%. 
the Labour very slightly down, the Liberals down 5%, SNP down 4%. Nothing very typical about that because we've only had 11 results in. But that is the key part of the story, the percent change that we saw there, and that's what we should be watching. And on those figures, there was just enough swing, but that was including some very odd seats. We've really had about as untypical a lot. I think we've only had four seats in, which are Conservative Labour marginal, uh, Conservative Labour seats, and no marginals. Well, the interesting thing about Nelson Cohn, which used to be Sidney Silverman's old seat, is that the Tory party would have expected to win that easily on the basis of the kind of swing that we've been talking about. It only needed a swing of just over three quarters of a percent or so for the Conservatives to take that. But if there's a recount, clearly it's close, unless it's a recount for the Liberal not wanting to lose his deposit. Indeed. He was at 12.4 percent at the last election, just enough to lose his deposit, and maybe he's in that same position. We then uh, uh, ought to look perhaps at the way that the swing between the parties varies in the regions. David? Well, this will look very different as time goes on because this so far is based on very few results. But you can see there the much lower swing, which is certainly evidence of in what we've seen in the northwest, in the southeast higher, in Greater London, based on two seats, a 6% swing, two seats very different, one 8% and one just over 2%. Uh, we shall be seeing these figures change. We shall see this map. Again, and here's another result, I believe, on the way. The Conservatives have held Romford with a swing of 7%. That's a big gain, big swing to the Conservatives in Romford. That's Michael Newbert. And that's next door to Upminster, where we had the 7.8 thing. And you can see the change here. The Conservatives up, the Liberal vote collapsing in a seat where, of course, they were third last time, but they got 19% last time. This time they lose their deposit with only 11%. So we're getting 6% swing, and here is Leighton. This is Brian McGee's seat. His majority is down 5,000, down 14%, a swing of 7% to the Conservatives. Brian McGee, who's a broadcaster and philosopher, and uh, interviews philosophers as well as being one himself. And uh, this seat used to be, was fought by Patrick Gordon Walker, actually, and he didn't make it. This is the third East London seat we've heard from. They've each had a swing of around 7%. That's quite clearly set for that area. We now have City of London and Westminster. Turnout of 55%. Conservative in with a majority of 9,000, which is an increase of 14% from the by-election. There was a by-election there. We don't, when uh, Christopher Tugendhat went to the EEC to work in Brussels, and we don't show the swing when there's been a by-election, for a but reason actually, that I never understand, but we don't anyway. But compared to 1974, there was about a 7% swing in the City of London and Westminster. And the encouraging thing about that is uh, that the Labour candidate was uh, a West Indian. And the last time a West Indian stood in London was a sign of the prejudiced voting. This seems to be showing just the same swing as we've been having in the other London results. Well, we're showing, just for those of you who follow this business of swing, and remember what, David, uh, what Bob McKenzie was saying over there about Mrs. Thatcher's need for 3.5%, 4%, 4.5% for an overall majority. The swing is showing at the moment in the east about 5%, in Greater London about 6%, and uh, up in the northwest, where we've only had two results in, it's down at 2%, figures which... I'm sure Dennis Healy, the Chancellor, who's sitting up there in Leeds, I think ready to talk to us, will no doubt be interested by. Robin? Yes, and I have the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Healy, in Leeds. Uh, good morning, Chancellor. Good morning, Robin. Are you resigned to a Labour defeat, having heard uh, Mrs. Mackenzie and Butler say it's virtually certain now that Mrs. Thatcher will have an overall majority? Not at all. I, I think the interesting thing at this stage is the wide regional variation and the extent to which the swings depend on the collapse of the vote of some third party. What seems to be happening to me so far is that the Liberal vote in the south of England has fallen very steeply and overwhelmingly to the advantage of the Conservatives. In Scotland, it's the Scottish Nationalist vote which has been falling very steeply and overwhelmingly to the advantage of the Labour Party. In Lancashire, which is the only part of the north of England, if you can so describe it, which has yet uh, had any seats declared, the, there seems to have been a small swing in those particular seats uh, to the Conservatives, very much smaller than in the south of England, and it's not quite clear to me at this stage what is the role of the Liberal vote there. I think uh, if you do lose your job as Chancellor, you've obviously got a future as a Cephologist, if I may say so. <laughs> uh, what, why do you think Labour has not 
done as well as you might have hoped? Well, as I say, so far we've mainly seen results in pretty safe Conservative seats and one or two seats on the London fringe. And um, I suspect that the duration of the industrial troubles, uh, rubbish in the streets and so, so, so on, has played a role in the South. Um, I think the striking thing, as I say, is the fact that there's a swing to Labour so far in Scotland and a very small swing in Lancashire in those seats yet declared. Thank you, uh, Mr. Healy. I don't know whether we'll be able to come back to you later, but if we do, I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And uh, do you wish me to continue with my friends here from the House of Lords? Because Lord Helsham is here, and Lord Helsham watched his own former constituency, because he is indeed Lord Helsham of St. Marylebone, but apart from that, are you now totally convinced of a Labour, of a Tory victory? I don't believe in predicting these results, because I think the one thing which was uh, certain from my little tour around the country was that the pattern was going to be much more patchy than um, uh, people thought. I think this question of national swings is based on a fallacy of past voting behaviour. I think that different parts of the country are going to do different things. It's a good thing when the people don't conform to the seafologist's wishes, isn't it? Well, I always um, think, regard the seafologists as a phony science rather. They can do a certain sums, <coughs> but um, they're, they're, they're always basing themselves on past voting behaviour, and therefore they can't predict. We just heard that there's going to be a recount at Hornchurch, and that is a particularly interesting matter. Uh, isn't it, Lord Beard? Well, uh, I'm finding it all very interesting. Uh, I'm anxious, though, to see some of the northern seats. Uh, Dennis Healy is quite right. Uh, I think of uh, some of the north seats of County Durham. I'd like to see my own seat, Workington. I think we can still win that back. Well, it so, ought to, oughtn't you? Well, we should. And, uh, we did very well. I was up there, and I think um, um, my people, my former uh, Officials worked hard and the candidate worked, worked hard, so I'm hoping that we'll win Workington. You say you, do you think Labour can still uh, uh, win the election as a result of uh, results in the marginals, particularly those in the north? Well, I haven't seen them in the north yet. No. That's why I want to see the northern yes. results. And well, then I'll come to a judgment. Uh, Eric, uh, Avery, But I what? think that there is a tide flowing, obviously, towards yes. the Conservatives. Now that we've had a few more results, what do you want to add to what you last said, uh, Lord Avery? I think if one was going to have to put any money on it at the moment, it would be certainly on a Conservative victory, but not on a Conservative overall victory. I think that it's still possible at this stage that the Conservatives, whilst they might have the large number of seats, wouldn't attain an overall majority. You're thirsting after a hung parliament, a lib lab pact, and I think that, that the objective... compact, I mean. It's possible <laughs> that the objective which uh, David Steele set himself at the beginning of the campaign may be attained, uh, but if no party had an overall majority, then I think it would be necessary for all the parties to discuss the next step with each other instead of defining in advance what sort of pact would be created. Thank you. David Dimblebane? Lord Thornycroft has said that he's happy at the moment, but that he wants also, as they were saying over there, he wants to see some marginal results before he makes any prediction. And we had that news that Hornchurch, which would need a 7.5% swing for it to fall to the Conservatives, is having a recount. Now we've got one or two results in. Let's have a look at these. Newcastle upon Tyne Central, the second smallest constituency, and that's uh, been held by Labour with a majority of 7,000. That's down from a by-election. That was uh, Ted Short's old seat. He resigned and went to work in cable and wireless. That must be a profoundly disappointing result for the Liberals, who in the by-election jumped up to 19%, 28% of the vote and got second place. Now they're down to 13%, only just uh, saved their place, deposit in third place. Nevertheless, that is a very safe... Uh, seat we go to Accrington which has been a Labour seat since 1945 though often with a small majority and the majority there is down from 6,000 to 3,200 and the swing to the Conservatives about 3.6 percent that's Arthur Davidson has been the MP there since 1966. Further confirmation of a much lower swing in the north and northwest. This is the change of the vote in Accrington. You can barely spot the Labour change, a tiny red line if you have a colour television set, and goodness knows what, if you only have a black and white television set, you may not be able to spot it at all. Minus 0.3%. And the Liberal vote, you see, down. down. And Walthamstow, 
This again is a Labour safe seat. This used to be a Clem Matley's seat. Eric Deakins has been the MP there since 1970 and he's had a swing against him and against Labour of 9% in Walthamstow. This is the biggest swing yet. The Conservatives up 13%, Labour down 5 The East End of London is just doing extremely badly for Labour. And if the country behaved like the East End of London, there'd be a landslide. If it behaves like Lancashire, there'll be a hung parliament. The interesting thing is the National Front vote dropped again there, 2% down. It was down from 1,900 down by 700 or so seats. All the French candidates have been doing very badly. They lost their deposit and the Liberals lost their deposit as well. Now I think Bob has been, I don't know quite what Bob's been doing. Bob, what have you been doing? I've been brooding over the figures coming out of the computer and they're saying at the moment that there's a 4% swing to the Conservatives. Taking these big swings in the south and the very tiny swings in the north to conservatives it's averaging out for what averages are worth at this stage to just this sort of conservative overall majority now if the southern figures harden and things improve for the conservatives in the north then we can expect an overall majority but at the moment the average over the whole country is settling in there now the other thing to note and I myself think it on present evidence might well go over four percent but at the moment that's where it is an overall conservative majority, but a small one. Now, the liberal story, we have only so far very spotty evidence for the liberals, but it's not on the whole encouraging. The liberal vote is going down in a number of places, but we have not yet heard from any of the liberal held seats. And here many of us have suspected that the fame of people in those seats, whether it be Penhaligon or whether it be Par uh, Clement Freud or whether it be uh, uh, Pardo, the extent of publicity they've got may more than make up for some decline in liberal support overall throughout the country. And of course the strategy of the Liberal Party has been to try to hold their seats, this group of seats, and to broaden it in the ones they still think they have a chance to get. So we can't yet judge whether the strategy of David Steele has worked or not. We know that he's had a personal success in terms of public opinion everything else. We cannot tell yet whether this liberal wedge theory is going to work. It's early days for them, and we'll have to come back to that later on. Back to David. Well, it's amazing, really. I've, I've not sat in this chair before, but by quarter to one in the morning, David, you would normally be... Oh, we'd be quite clear. We'd be giving you a very firm prediction right. of the exact numbers, and we just have had so few seats, and such as we've heard, for, uh, which are ones of good indicators, and such as we've heard from have been giving a fairly diverse story. The more uneven the swing, the longer one has to wait to give a confident prediction. We have only had 17 seats in so far, which means we have 618 to come. And the figure to remember, of course, is 318. 318 gives a party the right to form the next government without any conversations with anyone. If it were Mrs. Thatcher who had 318, she would simply wait until Mr. Callaghan had been to the palace and go herself. And uh, kiss hands and form a new government. We've got... Uh, the state of the parties after those 17 results, and you see again from Big Ben, it is just after quarter to one. And there we are. The reason there's no change is because there's no change. We haven't heard from marginals yet. We've heard of two recounts, though. A recount in Nelson and Cohn, uh, which means a very small swing, and a recount in Hornchurch, which means a very large swing, if they're actually recounting the top two candidates and not just recounting to see if somebody's lost his deposit or not. We've been talking so fiercely about these swings that I'd assumed we had got some changes. We've got another recount, and this time at Battersea South, well, a that, London recount. That's a much bigger swing. That's about a 5% swing that is needed for Battersea South to go. 4.7% swing would be needed for Battersea South to go. That, in fact, is rather better than the other London results. I think the swing is much smaller in the centre of London than it is out in the eastern suburbs toward we, Essex. We do have to be cautious. There are recounts for the Liberals, and the Liberals, again, were very close to being... They were third last time, and they were very close to losing the deposit last time, and it could be that that caused a recount. It Though Theodore Wallace, who's a barrister, his second attempt as Conservative candidate, is no doubt, um, from his point of view, it would be very nice if it's a recount against Alfred Dubbs, the Labour candidate. It was a gain from the Conservatives in 1964 in Battersea. Conservatives, Norman Lamont hold Kingston on Thames. With a 6% well, swing. That's not a surprise. Norman Lamont, who's uh, a close, what you call, close ally or close associate of Mrs. Thatcher, one of the key thinkers on economic matters. I have somebody talking to me 
from way out in the country, but since you haven't told me who she is or whether I should go and talk to her, I think we'll leave her talking and we'll go instead to Robin Day. Robin? And here we have Peter Jenkins and Peregrine Worthstone, and gentlemen, we've got more material for you to uh, analyse. Uh, has your view changed uh, since you spoke earlier? Well, I think we're seeing the north-south factor coming into play here. And if it does turn out to be a, a two-nation election, and Mrs. Thatcher wins, but her strength is concentrated in the south and in the suburbs, and Labour does very well in the north, I think that makes it more difficult for her to govern the country. Can you explain why, maybe a rather obvious question, but some may be puzzled, why should there be a swing two or three times as much in, say, Leighton and Walthamstow than there is in, in Salford and places like that? Very largely um, a function of the, of, of, the lib of the collapse of the Liberal vote. I think that people who voted Liberal in the 1974 elections in the South are much more ready to support Mrs. Thatcher. I think in the North, Mrs. Thatcher has, has put many of these people off and some of them are going to Labour. Labour has held Lee, we've just been heard. May I, uh, best been told, may I come to you, Perry? What uh, do you make of the result? Does it <coughs> cause you to wonder whether the Conservative majority is going to be overall? I, I'm reminded of, I think it was George, George Eliot who said that of all human error, prophecy is the most unnecessary. And of course, one's being paid to, uh, to in fact, uh, indulge in this particular <coughs> unnecessary you're era. You're not being paid to prophesy, <laughs> you're being paid to look brilliant. I have no idea. I mean, I, the, the, these kind of figures absolutely leave me baffled. Yes. We all have to pretend to, to, to be wise before the event, but uh, I do find it much easier to be wise after the event. And the Conservatives hold Newcastle North, we have. Um, do you agree with what Peter Jenkins was saying, that if there is a North-South division in the uh, election results, that this will make Mrs. <coughs> Thatcher's job of governing more difficult, yes, I, even if she wins? I do. I, I don't know whether I would put it in the north and south. I, I think the, the problem for Mrs. Thatcher will certainly be that there is a tremendous uh, body of opinion moving rightwards in this country. It, it, it includes some elements, of course, of the middle class. It includes elements of the working class. There's also a very significant element in this country that is moving not exactly to the left, but determined not to be pushed around by the kind of things that Mrs. Satcher wants to do. There is going to be a very difficult period, even if she wins quite a substantial majority, because there's going to be a very significant minority which is not going to go along with her. Labour has held Motherwell by that majority which you see on your screen. David? And in Motherwell they pushed the SNP third of the poll. The SNP dropped a third of the poll, I think, there. Yes, I think they also had a bad result in air, which I believe that the Conservatives have held, which could have gone Labour on a very big swing, but there aren't those very big swings. There you have the figures for air, and though the, if the SNP are in third, uh, have gone to fourth place from third place. Well, we, um, Perry was saying that prediction was unnecessary and dangerous and unwise. I leave prediction to the computer, and our computer now has its prediction after 22 results. This is what it's saying that Mrs. Thatcher will form the next government, that she will have 337 seats in the new parliament, that Labour will have 271, the Liberals 9, the SNP 3, way down from where they were, and the other parties 15. So that our prediction at 10 to 1 on the basis of 22 results, and heaven help us if we're wrong, is Mrs. Thatcher will have a clear majority a working majority, 19 seats, that gives her, and enough, as Bob Mackenzie would say, to last a full parliament, even if by-elections start going against her. And this is the figure, the blue at the bottom, 318 is what she needs, and that's how we think it's going to look at the end of this election, which isn't, I might say, at the end of tonight, it's at the end of tomorrow afternoon. It's 19 David. seats more than she needs, but it's a 38 overall majority that she would have over all parties, and by-elections wouldn't erode in a majority like that. Motherwell and Wishaw, Labour hold a swing, a tiny swing from the Conservatives to Labour in Motherwell and Wishaw. This is a, a Scottish seat southeast of Glasgow. And the SNP go into third place there. The massive the drop in the SNP vote. So what? was being said about the other SNP vote uh, seats being untypical. It seems to be borne out here. A massive drop, 20% in the SNP vote. The Conservatives up 11% and Labour up 12%. The drop in the SNP giving this very tiny swing 
from the Conservatives to Labour of 8%. Conservatives hold Chingford, this is Norman Tebbit, one of the so-called Gang of Four, Mrs Thatcher's Gang of Four, who make raids, intellectual raids, or raids of argument on uh, the Labour Party from the Tory backbenchers, with a very big swing again, 8.5% in Chingford. Another very good example of the very even swing we're having in the east end of of London. We've had about six results there and they've all been in the 7 to 9% range. This is 